Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am lucky enough to be joined by Claire Keaton-Roberts, a teacher and academic. Good afternoon Claire. Hi Ross. Uh, thank you for joining me. So just for context for everyone listening, uh, Claire and I uh, are at the Faculty of Education, or are we were. Claire has just graduated uh, in her doctorate, so congratulations Claire. Uh, we thank met a couple of years ago and I remember you said um, I'm in my sixth or seventh year and we were just chatting about the journey before we came on air about the process. So what I'd like to do with you is to talk about your research um, to begin with. Um, could you just give everyone a, I know this is a really hard question, Claire, but a synopsis, a 30 second synopsis of your research. Absolutely. Um, I've always been very interested in educational leadership. And um, for me, I've always said that leadership is about people. It's about understanding um, how people work together. and. As I've sort of progressed in my career, I've, I've worked for um, a developing multi-academy trust, and I was really interested in how leaders work in, in a multi-academy trust. So my research is a, a single study, uh, case study of a multi-academy trust, and I really focused on um, this idea of what it's like for leaders working in multi-academy trust. And I just, I define that as head teachers, as senior leaders, as governors and centralised team as well. And, and for the first time, it's a piece of research that stepped back from concentrating on outcomes. Mm -hmm. So the, the Multi Academy Trust supports positive outcomes for children, but actually looking at what it feels like and what it looks like for, for leaders within Multi Academy Trust. Okay, um, fascinating. So we'll come back to the kind of details of that. Um, how does it feel to have graduated? It was quite a recent thing for you, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I I did my Viva in um, end of September and yeah, it, it was amazing. I had a bit of a, a turbulent time in that I was pregnant as I submitted and then I had the baby and then I did my Viva. So I've had a really busy couple of months, but um, it was really lovely to be able to talk about my research and, and to have yeah. a professional- so For teachers that don't really know the details of how, how that's conducted, give it, uh, describe, uh, you probably did it virtually I suspect, but what, describe the kind of experience, uh, the process, the people that are involved, or how many, how long it's for, that type of stuff. So you submit your written thesis of usually about 80,000 words, and then eight weeks after you do a viva, which is essentially, they call it a defense of your thesis, which I always think is quite scary. Um, but you choose your examiners, you have an internal examiner at your institution and an external examiner, which is great because you can choose someone who's um, really vested in your research and has a, um, strong expertise in the area. Um, and then eight weeks after submission you do, um, it was absolutely like this, it was yeah. virtual and they have questions to ask, they've, they've read your research in advance um, and so they, they want to just sort of delve a little deeper into the choices that you've made. Um, it was about, mine was about an hour long yeah. and it, it didn't feel scary to be honest. Did you find any uh, really hard questions that you couldn't answer or do you think you were well equipped? Yeah, no, I think it was okay, actually. It wasn't too bad. There was one that, that flew sort of threw me right at the end, which was, what do you think um, Hargreaves would say about your research? And I thought that was, it was a nice way to finish. It got me to really reflect on, on what I've done. But yeah, no, it was, it was fine. Um, great. Um, so the, um, the process of the Viva, um, I'm curious, is, do you think there are certain experiences throughout your doctorate that might inform your life as a teacher and you know I'm quite fascinated in the Viva process for an appraisal methodology squeezed into a year where the teacher sets their own target and it's critiqued with school leader CPD leader and maybe a mentor in their school um, so that, that's my thinking but what, tell me some of the things that you've experienced through your doctoral process that have influenced your work at, back at school. For me, well, for leaders, I think schools work at such a fast pace. We're sometimes making decisions um, that, that sometimes we, we don't have the time to think and properly reflect on why we're doing those things. And then we end up doing things, you know, that, that aren't the right things for, at the right time. And I think doing the doctorate has helped me to stop, reflect and try to understand what the existing research, existing thoughts around that particular process is to then make an informed decision. 
And that balance between the rigour of academic writing and the fast pace of schools is what mean is what makes um, it really hard to marry those two worlds together. Mm. And for me, it's it's made me a better leader because I'm more informed in my approach. Um, and, but it did mean that my research at times was a bit sketchy because I would do it the way I was working in a school to try to get it. Get no, it I, I mean, my, my life now kind of freelance and trying to support schools from a different perspective, it's really hard to battle that kind of, well, not only the self-employment pressure from the, the pandemic, but just that nature of working in normal circumstances and then trying to settle down to deep work when you've got lots of external forces um, pulling you away from what you want to do. Um, how has the whole lockdown experience been for you? I, I yeah. guess let me frame this differently uh, as a parent and as a teacher. So maybe let's start as a parent first. Um, so I, I also have a four year old. So she isn't quite at school yet, um, but she <laughs> was meant to be going to nursery and she really missed her friends. And my husband's a teacher as well. So we're both at home trying to teach our online lessons whilst having a toddler that didn't quite understand what was going on yeah. um so i massively sympathize with with families who've got more than one child um as a teacher uh i think very quickly we we learned to adapt to working online and i think i had shied away from it before i was thinking a bit nervous and, and didn't know much about online working um and that, that's massively changed. I'm a lot more confident with that now. It's something I'll be using in, in teaching mm -hmm. forever more. But um, yeah, it's, it's been a very strange time. Uh, how has your school, you know, what, what have kind of been the highlights in, since March 2020 for your school? You know, shifting curriculum, adapting to remote teaching. How, how has it been? Yeah, so I think we have constantly been slowly changing things to, to ensure that we're keeping up with what's going on. But I think the approach we had to the remote teaching um, was excellent. We, we've got a massive school. We work in a huge school with um, over 400 children in each year group. So the challenge for us doing live lessons was whether to include all staff and have it in a small classes or whether we should stream it for whole year groups. And I think we did a bit of both to mm. understand the, the best way to go. And I think we, we settled with a happy medium in the end. Um, but yeah. So um, um, so what, what's it like now? You know, kid, you know, lockdown technically, schools are open, kids are in, you might have one or two self isolated And what, what are the pressures that you're under? I think um, it's, it's a completely new way. For, I think the pressures on staff is that it, it's obviously a huge change, completely new way of working. Um, the bubble system, so i give you the example of our school having 400 in a tutor group, we have year group bubbles mm -hmm. um, and they're spread out around the school. And what it seems like is that we have lots of mini schools rather than one big school. So although that that initially that change was um was really difficult to manage and really difficult for people to understand it's actually produced something really lovely because we have these mini schools that have a stronger sense of community we have the heads of years and the assistant heads of year able to do some really intricate work over a small um physical space not the large campus that we're used to um, and i think that's been a real strength actually and it's, it's going to change how we approach um you know the physical being of our buildings and the structure of our lessons. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard quite a few stories that you know there are some positive consequences, I guess, of the virus, making people rethink about how they'll approach um, things. Have you had any, um, you know, any cases with staff? Yes, we have had. <coughs> yeah. Um, so it's interesting because you know the you know I'm looking at the unions and calling for transparency you know calling for the government to fund schools to cover those costs what what you know without going into too much confidential details what have been the key messages around your leadership team in terms of where real difficult decisions have had to be made um it's quite difficult for me to answer that actually Ross because I'm actually on maternity leave again, so I'm I'm a little bit detached from, okay, from sure. in that sense. Um, so you're kind of observing at a distance in some. So you've been at home since when? Um, maternity. <laughs> so my maternity started July, um, but I've been at home since March. <laughs> so um, uh, so let, let's just shift on slowly to kind of life as a a teacher. The kind of flexible working agenda. Um, 
what are your thoughts? I mean, I, 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 I'm sure at some point it's either crossed your mind or it's something you might want to speculate in the future. I don't know. I don't want to get too personal, but um, how is flexible working from your perspective? Um, so I worked full time before having my first daughter. And then I went to 0.9 and 0.8 and flitted between 0.9 and, and 0.8. Um, and really, that was for me to complete my research because um, for, I'm a strong believer that, that a weekend for me is my family time. And so I always had Monday to Friday as my work time. Mm. I would have family time between five and seven um, and then put the child to bed. And then um, I would do a little bit more work. So. I think the challenge that, that um, parents have, and particularly women as well, um, is having that cut-off period uh, between work and, and being a parent and not to be really hard on yourself. Because mm -hmm. I've my daughter's four now, and I've, I've found it extremely hard to not... I would say to myself, I'm not being a brilliant colleague or I'm not being a brilliant parent. And I think that's OK. You can't be the best person you so, want to be all the so time. So what advice have you been giving yourself? You know, if we talk about this mental health um, discussion, um, how do you, um, you know, that, that perfectionism that we all have, especially as teachers, uh, how do you manage that? I, I have battled with that. I have really battled with it. And for me, I have to, I have to with my work stuff, I have to draw a line and say, that can wait, that can wait till tomorrow, that can wait till um, whenever it can wait to and prioritise. And it's, I hear these words and I hear people give me that advice five, 10 years ago and it, it didn't mean anything. Yeah. Um, and there's probably people listening saying, oh, no, yeah, everyone says that, but you have to be so strict with yourself, taking your emails off your phone, um, not being tempted to have a look at your emails over the weekend. It's really, really important. Uh, so um, I'm sure you are, you know, obviously maternity and lockdown and things like that. But um, what, what tips would you give to new teachers in particular who are joining the profession at this time? Uh, have started in September, uh, dealing with lockdown, dealing with remote teaching, you know, all the mental health. Give us, give us maybe one or two insights or stories and what would be your top tip? Wow, my top tip, um, and I, I think it's, it's so hard for, for trainee teachers and NQTs at the minute, because my top tip would always be to observe, observe, observe. And, and, and I remember in my training year, wanting to just get into the classroom and have a go myself and, and you know, slowly realising that I wish I'd seen a lot more people do things um, mm -hmm. in different ways. So for me, it'd be, be observing all the time. But it's going to be hard right now, isn't it? We're absolutely, lockdown. absolutely. At the minute, I would just say, please do not be hard on yourself. Please do not push yourself to try to be um, the best, most amazing teacher because we are all struggling through this completely new way of working. And that goes for the children as well. They're, they're working in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. Be kind, be kind to yourself. Um, and, you know, for school leaders, you know, uh, when... I, you know, my life as a deputy is do your work after school hours or first thing in the morning. I used to do the cover. So I was in my desk at six o'clock, 6.30 sometimes before the kids and staff started to come in. And then I knew I was dealing with their agendas, not necessarily mine. What would be your top tip for school leaders at this time? You know, with all the government announcements, all the pressures, managing staff mental health as well as kids and parents. Um, it's very hard to prioritise, but what would, what, where would you? Yeah, and for me, I think the reason why a senior leadership team is called a team is because you have to be so supportive of each other. And I think we often, as senior leaders, forget about our own mental health. And sometimes we portray an image that we are invincible and we are there to fight all the fires and support all, all our staff all the time. Um, and I personally make a, a point of saying to my head teacher, are you okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and genuinely meaning, are you okay? Because what we're doing at the minute is really hard. And actually articulating that, because when you're muddling through things, it's really easy to get lost in the, the sort of operational things and not have a time to sort of reflect on how you're feeling about things. And, and that goes for, you know, really difficult things like dealing with staff and staff contracting COVID and, and students contracting COVID. And, um, and it's, so, it's so important that we sit and we just reflect and, and ask each other how we are doing and, and what we can do to help each other. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Um, I want to return back to your research. Um, only 
for probably selfish reasons for myself, because I've got to go through this journey that you've been through. Um, but I also want to try and pitch it for teachers who are really interested in research and want to kind of know maybe that journey that you have to go on. Um, and I know you've kind of done a huge body of work over six, seven, eight years. Uh, so it won't do it justice to squeeze it in two or three minutes, I know. But um, ha, ha, what would be your top tip for a teacher that's curious about starting a doctorate? Um, so a doctorate has to be an original contribution to knowledge. Um, so first of all, you need to be, you need to have an idea of something you might be interested in researching. And then you need to take a moment to see if what's out there already from a literature point of view, um, because if someone's already done it, then it won't stand up as a piece of research. Um, read as much as you can, because as you go into the doctorate, um, there will be an interview to get onto the course and you'll be pitching your idea. And it's a bit, I mean, it's a bit like Dragon's Den. You're trying to persuade the, the university that this research is worthwhile and it needs doing and it needs doing now. Um, so have an idea of what you might want to do Mm -hmm. um, and read around it to get a better idea of what already exists. Now, I, I think I've I've personally grasped the methodologies, the kind of mixed methods that you can explore. Um, could you just uh, articulate to listeners the method that you used, uh, how you grappled trying to identify what where which path to go down, and 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 what benefit it had of selecting your particular approach. So re research methods in itself is a complex field and depending on what you're studying lends itself to the methodology you choose and because I was looking at perceptions of leaders and experience of leaders for me it was always about a case study of these leaders stories um, and I did that through interviews I could have done a few questionnaires but I chose interviews because it's very personal it's very um, you can really understand and you can Sort of delve a little bit deeper into individuals perceptions and stories over over time um, i have an added um, element to my research is that it was longitudinal so yeah. i had two data collection points that were three years apart which right. also added to the unique nature of my research is understanding a multi-cabinet trust over a period of time rather than at one period of time um and how did you get into a rhythm of writing and reading regularly <laughs> Um, to be honest, I don't think I did. Uh, it was very ad hoc. Uh, before lockdown, I would religiously on a Saturday um, go to a coffee shop and just do writing there because I didn't have any distractions. Um, and I, I enjoyed that. And then lockdown happened. And to be honest, lockdown saved my doctorate because I was stuck in the house and all I could really do was <laughs> do my writing. The, the bit at the end is particularly difficult because you have all of the um, the data coming in and things like that. Like referencing and bibliographies. Um, so what are your top tips there for someone who's still got to dabble with all that uh, and pull my finger out? What will be your top tip? So your bibliography, definitely use a piece of software that will help you with that, like Zotero, um, because you will end up having 200 to 400 different um papers that you'll be referencing in terms of the referencing i made a, a bit of a mistake and i had, had to um do a lot of work at the end uh make notes of what you're referencing all the time have it in one central place you can flick back yeah. i ended up having quite a few research journals um but the over eight years there was a lot of flicking through to try and find which paper that was from and wow. i wish i had recorded that a lot better to be honest now um i'm curious what what from the experience of your doctorate what what things have you learned that you now apply into your life as a school leader so my research was about um a leadership in the multi-academy trust and one of the things that i found is that um, leaders were not sufficiently aware of, um, of of understanding the trust they're working in. Sometimes this, you know, generalisation here. Um, and so for me, it's it's made me a lot more aware of the trust I'm working in. It's it's made me ask questions about the trust and how I can, as a leader, support the trust and how the trust can support me as a leader. And so personally, it's 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 made me ask some questions about my leadership. Uh -huh. And what, what impact or what do you think you're going to do next now it's published? 
So I'm really interested in working in newly formed multi academy trusts and those that are established but are asking other academies to join, because I think there is a body of work that we could be doing where um, trusts are really articulating to schools and to leaders what it means to be in their trust, what it means in terms of their you know uniform policies um, where they stand on these type of things and if that isn't clearly articulated I found in my research that leaders get very frustrated and they then they're not entirely sure um, the purpose of of the trust yeah no absolutely all about purpose particularly working in schools mm. um so we've gone past our 20 minute barrier Claire and I warned you before we came on that we're, I'm going to fire loads of quick fire questions at you not necessarily a quiz but I, I want to kind of catch you off guard my performance has not been very good of late so but I'm going to try my hardest and see how we get on um so I'll start with some easy ones um what what project are you working on at the moment uh raising a baby raising a baby okay uh, what <laughs> books are you reading for fun um uh, hello magazine <laughs> okay um, what's the kind of kids cartoon uh, that you're currently engrossed in that you're now oh. singing the songs to your kids oh frozen two frozen two okay uh, a piece of advice um for a teacher who's starting to get interested in all this cognitive science research read 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 have an opinion form your own opinion dream job now i'm assuming doctoral research and teaching is your dream job but what's that one off what off the wall career that you wish you'd done ballet dancer ballet dancer fantastic um what's your biggest career achievement today um that's a hard one. Oh, oh creating a building a really positive and well-formed team within the team i'm working with at the minute okay great um three positive characteristics that you know you're working in a great multi-academy trust um collaboration uh, -huh. uh openness uh and transparency okay and uh, what did you have for dinner last night these are hard ross all right so i'm testing your memory recall <laughs> Uh, lamb lamb very nice uh was it seasons <laughs> <laughs> um who would you recommend i interview next and why um, 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 um oh, that's a very hard question toby greeny because he is the girl oh, toby, yeah okay the old academy trusts and, and why 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 toby he the stuff he's writing at the minute about multi academy trusts and where they are positioned at the minute is really forward thinking okay fantastic um where can listeners connect with you more you know read your work or connect online you know twitter blogs websites yeah so i'm on twitter at music seahood um and i will share with the world my published work when i get around to it Fantastic. After raising the baby. <laughs> my final question, Claire, um, what would you hope to be your legacy? In terms of my research? In uh, terms of anything? Anything, anything and everything. I want teachers, I want leaders, I want people I work with to know that I care about them and to know that um, they are doing a good job and that good job is appreciated. Fantastic. What a lovely uh, way to end. Uh, so, Dr. Claire <laughs> Keaton Roberts, um, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, really, congratulations. Uh, haven't seen you go on your journey, or at least the latter half of it. And uh, you got your hands full there at home. Uh, but I look forward to your research being public uh, and seeing what impact it has on you know, the multi academy trust dialogue in England in particular, as you'll know, is very vast transparent in places opaque in other parts um so it'd be a fantastic contribution uh, and i wish you all well with the rest of your maternity leave lockdown and everything else um so thanks claire very much right thanks ross